Welcome to Fresh Pulp Magazine's Dark Matter Spaces. I am Jay Austin Yoshino. I am the editor-in-chief of Fresh Pulp Magazine, and I am your host. Right next to me in the next little window here is um, the indefatigable Marguerite Hill. She is the um, the co-founder and director of Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, and she is also the future strategist for Fresh Pulp Magazine. Uh, and uh, Muslim Arc is a co-sponsor of this podcast. And I feel like you're sitting really high. Like I need to sit higher now because you're yeah, sitting really high. I'm kind of low, maybe kind of far. Like I'm really close. I'm really close. So you know, to my thing. So yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try to like. Okay. Anyway, so um, I think that everybody should go to Muslim Arc's uh, website. Uh, you should go to their social media. You should interact, engage with, find out what they're doing, find out how you can be a part of it, find out how you can contribute. It is a wonderful organization. They have fantastic uh, anti-racism uh, competency training. I took it, and honestly, I'm a better person for having done so. You can also go to Fresh Pulp Magazine's social media. We have a little tip pit tip bar that helps us with things like books and operating costs. This stuff is not exactly free, but uh, any little amount will help. Any amount will help. We really appreciate it. So, having said that, let's jump into our... Um, Let's jump into it this, this week. So this week we're going to talk about the final episode of, of Black Mirror, um, Demon 79, and then we're going to talk about the first episode of Foundation. So uh, let's talk about Demon 79. I, let's talk about Demon 79. I'm going to give the beats first, okay? Um, Demon 79 takes place in 1979. I, I want to say London, but I feel like it's not London. I feel like... It's like Midlands or like Manchester or something, because it's just because the way that they talk. But I could be wrong. Um, I'm not a linguistic expert. Um, and the main character, a woman named Nita, um, is kind of like this miserable sort of, um, a, you know, lonely person living in 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 this big British city, presumably London. And she works in a re- she works in retail, and she goes to her job every day. Um, and she, you know she dresses frumpy and she just looks unhappy. Um, and she has you know these racist coworkers who do who have these like little microaggressive things that they do to her. Or this one woman that works with her is like always making her do the, the heavy lifting and all the hard work. And her boss is always complaining about like the food that she's eating on her lunch break and stuff like that. Anyway, one day while she's she's been sort of exiled to the basement so that her food doesn't continue to offend the sensibilities of her co-worker she happens upon a rune like a demonic rune and she as she discovers it she cuts her finger she picks up the rune and her blood activates the rune and when she gets home that night the rune starts talking to her and basically kind of browbeats her into allowing it to manifest physically in her in her in our world at least visually Anyway, and it shows up as this gruesome demon with huge horns and whatever, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and she's like, he like, decides to choose a more pleasing form for her, which ends up being the lead singer for Boney M, right? <clears throat> which, by the way, is <clears throat> and the show is not actually Boney M. It's a guy who's supposed to be him. <clears throat> supposed to be the singer, excuse me. And he tells her, hey, look, you activated this rune, rune and so now you have to kill three people and sacrifice in order to pre- prevent the end of the world. So, as you can imagine, this sort of, like, you know, like, this sort of, like, diminutive, small, like, frumpy, like, Asian chick now has to, like, murder three people, (laughs) right? Which, you know, in and of itself kind of represents a challenge, right? Because it's not like, it's not like black and brown folks kind of move unnoticed through, like, predominantly white areas, right? Anyway, so, um, so basically, like, as she's having this sort of debate with, the the demon about it like cause she runs out of her house because she's freaked out and she's standing near one of like the canals or rivers or something in 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 uh, London and this guy who's walking his dog is like walking by and he's like can I help you because she seems to be talking to herself the guy the demon she can only the de- demon only she can see the demon and so the demon is like you need to kill somebody oh look here's somebody kill him kill him and she's like no and the guy's like can I help you and he's like use the brick in your hand and she's like what brick and then she like holds her hand up and there's a brick in her hand anyway. So the guy comes over to her, and she's like, can I, can I help you? She cracks him in the head. 
one and done, right? Guy falls in the canal, he's gone, right? The demon is like, oh, he was a bad guy anyway, right? He was, like, molesting his daughter, and he's, like, this terrible person, and, like, you got him. And so he's like, now you only need three more, right? Three, three more before midnight three days from now. So then he, then he um, you know, she go, you know, she goes through more of this sort of drama at work, right? And, you know, she's helping an old lady and she's like with her coworker and he's like, yeah, you should kill your coworker, man. Just wait for her to go down the steps and just crack her in the back of that. Like he's constantly kind of cheering her on, but he, <laughs> he has this sort of air of benevolence about him, which is even though, you know, he's like a demon and he's evil. And at some point in the news, like she, she starts to kind of, withdraw like she starts to kind of like you know what this is crazy i just killed somebody i, I gotta i, I don't want to kill anybody else and she kind of starts to kind of withdraw into herself but then while she's watching the news she discovers that there are these rising sort of strategic tensions between you know britain and like and the soviet union right and so she, he's like see look look what's gonna happen like i told you there's gonna be like a wall of fire well i skipped over a part where he actually shows her using an illusion what will happen if she fails to kill three people like the world will end he says and there'll be it'll end in a wall of fire. So flash forward back to her watching television. She sees this newscast, and he's like, "You see, like you're gonna end up, you know, causing causing this to happen—a nuclear war. We're all gonna die, and that's what you know, wall of fire." So she starts like thinking about you know a second one, and she's like, "I need to find a weapon." So she goes to her kitchen, and she like pulls out a knife, and he's like, "Yeah, that's not you. You're not a stabber. Like you need you need to find <laughs> something to bash him with." So she like pulls out a, a hammer, and he's like, "Yup, that's it, right?" So then she, like, puts on her coat and, like, puts this hammer in her coat, and she goes down to the local pub, and, like, she's just sitting there by herself. She drinks scotch for, like, the first time ever in her life, like, two triples, and, like, there's this guy, something else I forgot to mention, who's, like, a, he's, like, a guy who killed his wife and went to prison but got out, and she, he's in the pub, and so she's, like, talking with, you know, the demon again in public, so people think she's crazy, and she follows the, the guy out. And, like, basically while he's, like, urinating in the alleyway, he's like, oh, look, it's you. Wow, you're a dark horse. I didn't expect you to, like, come at me like this. So he's like, let's go back to my place and, like, get busy. So they go back to his place. And then, you know, there's a little bit of, like, back and forth, but it's, it's pretty gross. She kills the guy. Um, and then she, right as she's done killing him, she, like, bashes his head in with his hammer. She tries to leave, but then somebody else comes home. So apparently this guy didn't live alone. And so as she's like trying to, to like sneak out, the floorboards creak, the guy notices her, they get into a tussle, she kills him. And then she's like completely freaked out at this point. And the demon is like, great, you know what? It, it worked out, you got three, we're done, this is it, right? And so they go home and he find, they find out later on that like the rune, which by the way, something else I forgot to mention, has these three marks on it. And as she kills a person, one, one mark disappears. There's still one mark left, and she's like, what the hell is this? He decides to call Hell, and Hell says, well, <laughs> the guy you originally planned to kill is not, he's not really, you know, he's not really eligible to be killed because he's a murderer. He murdered his wife. And they're like, wait, what? And she's like, yeah, basically, we like murderers down here, so you can't, like, kill him. So you killed him for no reason. But good news, you got his brother, the guy who came home in the middle of her killing, killing the guy. And he was eligible, so that's two. And she's like, wait, I got to kill a third person? Anyway, so she goes back to work, dealing with the same racist bullshit, microaggressions, everything else. But there's this guy who comes in who's, like, running for MP. And he's, like, he's, like, a, he's like a Tory, like, right, like, he's, like, a UKIP type. He's, like, a, a UKIP type in, like, Tory clothing, right? So, like, talk suave, has a suit, but he's, like, totally anti-immigration, like, hates foreigners. She, she sees him on the street giving a speech and, like he's talking about how he's going to get rid of all the immigrants and stuff and how the, the character of their neighborhood has changed. And so she's like, yeah, I'm going to kill that guy. And the demon's like, you can't kill him. And she's like, yeah, I can. He's, he's eligible, right? Has he killed anybody? He's like, no, but he's going to be responsible for a lot of deaths later on. And she's like, yes, but that's still within the kind of confines of what I'm allowed to do. I'm killing him. So she decides to, she decides to plan. He's giving a speech, decides to follow him from his speech, Something else that needs to be mentioned. The cops are now kind of not on to her, but they're kind of on to her at this point. So she's being followed. By the time she gets to this third guy, this cop is kind of on to her. This old cop. So, because they've discovered the bodies of the two people she killed before, plus the guy in the, in the canal. Anyway, so she follows this guy down this, like, deserted road. She's like, there's this stretch of deserted road between here, where he's giving this speech, and, like, this cabin he's going to stay at. So she follows him, runs him off the road, gets out, attacks him, doesn't get to kill him. 
and then the cop shows up and stops her and arrests her. I'm really, be, I'm really, 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 really off my game today because there's a bunch of stuff I forgot to mention. But one other thing that I forgot to mention. So many details. Demon... I mean, it's just like there's so much stuff happening with the story, though, compared to some of the other stories where the, the True. you know, like those details weren't all there. It, did, did that really yeah. matter? But, you know, for our story, to, like, I mean, I'm, I was like, yeah, there was a lot that happened in this episode. Yes. <laughs> so he, one of the things that he tells her, too, is that he can't, is that, is that the demon tells her that if, if this is like his first time doing one of these sacrifices and basically if he fails he's going to be exiled to this oblivion of like statelessness for eternity and so she's like in you know in jail and the cop is like yeah you're you know he's like oh she's cracked and whatever and 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 the demon shows up and she's like I'm really sorry that I failed and I know you're going to be exiled to oblivion and whatever the cop like leaves because there's an alarm going off and as it turns out, it's because this nuclear war is starting. <laughs> the demon is talking to, to, to Nita, and he's like, yeah, it's all right, you know, whatever. But he's like, but I did some research, and as it turns out, you can come with me to this oblivion if you want, because, by the way, it's going to be pretty shitty here in about two seconds. And so she's like, yeah, my life wasn't that great before. And then, like, they, they, they like, as, like, as, like, the blast wave is engulfing the police station, they walk out into the hallway and hold hands and walk off, presumably to oblivion. So that's the story. Feel free to inject any other details I miss because I know I'm like I said I'm kind of off today. No, I mean that was that was an excellent, excellent, I'm like, excellent. See, I haven't had my coffee. That was an excellent, excellent ah, um, play by play, like of all of of the details, you know. And and I think that's, um, I mean, when I loved Demon, right? I mean, he was just like '70s fabulous, you know. So she was like, yes. she was like looking at it, and you know. She she was, she was digging it. <laughs> she was feeling bony M, right? Yeah. So that was, um, you know, like that, that demon had, had a lot of swag and, um, you know, I mean, and, and Nita, the, the character was just really great. Like she's a, a fantastic actress. Um, you know, so you're kind of like really getting into like her complexity and, and feel justified right in her rage towards people but that was like also the thing that made her corruptible um yeah. so when he approached her so i mean i do have some some kind of i do have a few questions right like i mean even as this oblivion and when they're going into it it's like he's supposed to be in this like but experiencing this but now he's not ex gonna experience this alone so i i kind of was like interested in that kind of cosmic horror kind of like really like I'm, I'm just really on this kind of theme and, and trying to understand a little bit of that because I, I did feel that Lovecraftian sense in in this season and so is that this kind of cosmic horror of like that you have like eternity and and you're aware of this endlessness right and an abyss and and you know like what does that do to the mind right like i mean so have you been in one of those um those like have you been in like a, a sensory deprivation unit twice ever? a month i mean I don't know, twice a month so i yeah. mean i need i need to try that because i'm always like overstimulated but is there a certain point where people get a kind of panic because they're just like it depends on it depends on the type there are different types and one is like a you know the 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 older industrial ones that, that are literally like giant freezers, right? They're like huge, huge, huge tanks, and they're filled with Epsom salts to, to increase human buoyancy. Those can get really aggravating. There's the smaller ones that are tube-shaped. They look like Star Wars-type back-to-tanks that you float in standing up. Those also can be restricting um, because you're in a thing, right? Um, the one that I use is more like a bed pod-type one that you float in, and it actually, you can actually has a cradle outside for your iPod or your MP3 player, so you can you can get the the relaxation experience without complete deprivation. I prefer complete deprivation. And yes, after I tend to restrict my floats to an hour. After that, I feel like you're getting into some you you start to become untethered from your objective reality, right? And oh. so yes, you start panicking a little bit. So that that imagining that for eternity, right? And then and he was in isolation. But you know, if her living situation is parallel, right? Like she's 
I mean, going through the day-to-day -day life without meaning. Um, and she's like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather join this, this demon who, you know, who actually looks kind of good. He's kind of, you know, so <laughs> it's a very, it's a very great ending. I felt that I felt like the kind of like a little bit of a, um, a hopeful ending <laughs> at the, like for the season. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely, um, like have the, um, you know, like the question of them them saving each other, even though like, I mean, she did, does kill somebody that probably didn't deserve to die. Like, I mean, the brother of, of the, um, of that murder guy, you know, I mean, he seemed yeah. like he was a, you know, like a, I mean, you know, you have to be kind of a terrible person. Like, you know, like somebody that molests their child, that is just, just repugnant. And, and we find like that, you know, it's kind of definitely like irredeemable. Um, so uh, well, yeah, like cosmic... I mean, let's kind of go into mm -hmm. yeah, maybe move like kind of um, zo zoom in away from the cosmic thing because we're gonna kind of come back to that cosmic horror aspect. But um, you know, late seventies UK style wise was pretty terrible. Yep. You know, I mean, and and I kind of remember, like, that's, those are my first memories where, like, you know, that, not in the UK, but the US, like, the color schemes, the fashion. I mean, my dresses were cute. My mom was, like, definitely a fashionista. But <laughs> Everybody else was, was ugly, um, but I was rocking it. <laughs> I sure was. I used to let my cousins know, too. I was just like, oh, your hair is ratty, but mine is, you know. Oh, my God. Ponytails and you stuff. Need, you there. <laughs> so it was, um... But yeah, the, the, um, it just, you know, like, I mean, UK itself is kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a soggy place and coming from, you know, I'm speaking as, as a Californian, um, I did, I did kind of, I was like, wow, there's a lot of standing water. It's like, you know, springtime, it's, it's kind of gray and the, and, um, you know, I mean, it, it's just like, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a brown person an immigrant kind of growing up in in um like the challenge of that right so yeah um we, I, you know so it's almost like hell, I hell is other people or um the white man's no it's like the black man's what is that the, the the um the oh gosh lewis farrakhan song <laughs> like the um it's just like the the black man's hell is the white man's heaven, or like it's just right. That's what it right. kind of was. Yes, I remember that. Um, yeah, I I did that did that did. There were a couple of things that that struck me about this episode. I mean, it wasn't retro futurism, but it was retro, right? And so everything was was true to seventy nine. She was even reading a book. If if I noticed, called Creative Visualizations by a woman named Shakti Gawain, and Shakti Gawain is Shakti first of all, and forgive me anyone who is uh, who is a Hin Hinduism practitioner, practitioner of Hinduism, but Shakti is um, according to online sources uh, a feminine energy of the universe, right? And so this woman named Shakti Gawain in the '70s sort of took that as her sort of pen name and wrote a bunch of sort of like New Age Eastern philosophy like self-help books, and the main character. Who is, by the way, played by um, uh, uh, Anjana Vasan, right? And she's in We Are Lady Parts. Um, she's one of the main characters in We Are Lady Parts. Uh, she's reading the book. It's called Creative Visualizations, and I was like, I feel like that's on purpose, right? That they're kind of poking fun at like white people who appropriate Asian culture, because it also links to this microaggression she experiences at work when it came to her food. And they were like, well, your food has a tendency to linger. And I'm like, you know what? Every single one of you people, after you leave work today, is going to go down to some curry joint in your neighborhood <laughs> and get some food. But you're going to, like, crap on this poor woman over her food, which was not really about the smell of it. It was just about you being you being hostile towards her. Yeah, I mean, and when we know, like, British food is pretty terrible. I mean, not to say that American food just by itself, like, I mean, is great because right. it's not, but it's like... British food is just notorious without seasonings. Like they colonized Asia for the spices, but didn't use it. So it's just <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, it's just like the, you know, I mean, when I, I mean, I went to, to 
to the UK briefly. And I mean, yeah, like they have like some of the best um, day seafood there. But in, I mean, fish and chips. I mean, I had the worst Caesar salad I ever had in my entire mm. life there. I mean, just some of the stuff was just like really, really bland. You know, like, I mean, it's just like, um, I mean, I've had like stuff like beef Wellington and things like that. But it's like, it's, it's, there's nothing to like call home, home over. But, you know, like South Asian food, I mean, it's just amazing. It's, you know, like, and it has a lot of even healing properties. So, you know, like with all the spices and, you know, because that's what that's kind of like why we do spices, right? It's like they, so, they have those herbs. So I want to ask you a question mm -hmm. about um, something, something you and I touched upon briefly, but I want to ask you mm -hmm. because the demon asserts to her when he manifests that she's corruptible. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why she was chosen. And he kind of turned it into a plus. He was like, no, it, it's, it speaks very highly of you, actually, that you're that you're um, that you're corruptible. And I and I at first I didn't quite get that. But I mean, I did get it. But it meant something else to me after a minute, which is that you do have this aversion. The pe like, in other words, he's saying people who aren't corruptible are people who are predisposed to killing to begin with, whereas you aren't. Mm -hmm. It's just that you're corruptible. Now, I want to ask you what you thought about what, what you thought about that, like conceptually about the idea of being corruptible. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, that's like the human state of things, right? Like, so, so this idea that like, there's some uncorruptible people, it's like, come on, like, no, I mean, I mean, you know, like, I mean, you could see like aggression in, in, in babies, you know, like, it's just like there, it's just like, there's going to be like an aggressive aspect when they need what they need and want, you know, want what they want. Um, but I think that there was a little bit more as like as far as like her violent fantasies um and um and maybe those are those kind of intrusive thoughts so i definitely was like interested in you know like you have a lot of people on TikTok talking about intrusive thoughts but that's actually not what is like when people have that kind of disorder where it's like hey these thoughts are things that actually disturb them and and affect them in very profound ways um but it's this, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's like she, she's not a complete innocent. Um, and that's, that's, but it's like her lack of innocence comes from that experience, right? Like, I mean, if she had a, you know, smooth path and people just treating her amazing, like, you know, like with the white woman who was actually pretty blase with terrible hair and all these things, you know, that that like, you know, Anita is actually, you know, a very, you know, she's very cute, you know, like she's, she, you know, like we can dress her up, doll her up, but it, it wasn't like that they, like if she was given that, that silver spoon, then maybe she would have had more to defend. Um, and I think maybe that was the thing that it's like her anger, her rage inside that could be was was because of her experience of being abused in society. Exactly. So what corrupts exactly. people? What kind of leads them down that road? Was just like these people really jacked up. And not to say that an annoying person at work, because like I think in film, um, one of the tropes that I kind of see is like somebody's mildly annoying, and there's a satisfaction of murdering them on TV, which speaks to like, and why are we as an audience satisfied with that annoying, obnoxious person? Like even. If somebody's racist and has obnoxious, objectionable views, do they deserve life? Do they deserve to live? Yeah, like they shouldn't die because they're annoying. Sure. But like we, like we as an audience, like we love to like see that. Like, yeah, they got what they deserved, which is saying a lot more about us as an audience. How do you how do you feel that worked ultimately? Um, I mean, I think that like what I saw was like her moral like um her pragmatism come out as she was thinking about who deserve like who to kill and here was this person even though and she made a strong case that this person that was going to cause more harm even though it was going to be a harder kill right like there's like other people that would have been low-hanging fruit but she was going to go after the person who have more like who would cause more harm um which i said i think does speak about her ethics um and but that was also like the kind of downfall but then you know in the end it worked out well anyways because you know she ended up 
an eternity with, you know, with Boney M, you know, like the sexy right. Boney M. with Boney M. <laughs> it makes me wonder if he actually stayed Boney M in eternity, but because um, he could have gone back to being I'm sure he did. Form. He was probably like, I'm just going to be in the form of, you know, however you want, or maybe her form changed. Like, I mean, we're all in, like, meat suits. <laughs> well, I, and that's one of the things that I kind of wanted to... <laughs> one of the things that I kind of wanted to address, because you asked me about this, which is about this idea of them being in a perpetual sort of oblivion. And one of the things of that, as somebody who, who has researched these topics e extensively for stories and such, one of the things that's a recurring theme in a lot of 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 stories about demonic uh, demons and demonic possession is first of all people have this tendency to conflate demons with other types of supernatural phenomena and they're completely separate demons are in according to demonology and other texts and stuff demons are are creatures that have never been human or never walked the earth as human beings ever right so they're not werewolves they're not vampires they're not ghosts they're completely separate entities um the other thing is is that Demons are obsessed with, with with corporealism, right? Because they they exist in a they tend to exist in a what we would call maybe a pocket dimension, right? And so they they constantly observe us, wanting to find ways to access what we have. Like we're these corporeal beings that drink and smoke and eat and have sex, and they're like, I want that, but I want it like times a thousand, right? And so they hint at that in in movies about demonic possession, but they don't really really get into any, any explanation about that. So taking a demon and basically banning him, like sending him to him or her to a dimension where he, where his existence is formless or where he has corporeal uh, form, but it's meaningless because the dimension he's in is without substance at all, is like conceivably the worst possible punishment. Obviously, if he's got somebody else with him, that's different, but I mean, you know, that's gonna that's still gonna get boring, right? So that's so anyway. So I thought so that so that's like um, I mean, I like Anjana Vasan, but I don't know that I like her that much. But I will say finally, I do want to say I also enjoyed that ending, and the, I enjoyed the ending because because the ending was two people of color walking off to seek some semblance, some alternative form of life or happiness away from this this con this life that constantly needs or demands obeisance and erasure from you right they're like yep you know what? let's just go like i like that kind of theme so and, it, and i like the fact that it wasn't like you know like typically average white dude let's let's run off into the sunset thing yeah i mean it's it's um I mean, it was like walk away from the, the explosion type of, um, you know, like that, that, that look because they're like walking and slow and holding hands. It looks all cool. So it's like, um, yeah, like it's all cool. Like we're not going to like just really, sh you know, so they, they were still like there in existence. But, but I mean, their ultimate reality just sounds like really horrifying. You know, I mean, it's just like think of bad marriage where you're just like are just stuck. Like think about like the pandemic, like forever in your little tiny apartment not able to get out like that that was rough so so they got an eternity of roughness um but yeah, and I, and like, I, know, I, mean, I know there are things that we're kind of glossing over because there were a lot of racial <laughs> issues presented yeah. in that you know there are people putting signs on her door and uh um and the guy who was running for office who was like a you know ukip whatever member but um i do think we kind of need to move on to foundation because we're, we're yeah. about halfway through our podcast um, I, I will say real quick my final thoughts on, and I'll let you say your final thoughts on on Demon uh, Demon Seventy Nine. It was a, I I like the story. Um, it was funny, but it was also dramatic. I like um, Anjana Vasan, but mostly because of her eyes. That is that actress has some seriously expressive eyes, right? Like she when she, there's times when she was cutting her eyes at her coworker, and I was like, oof, man, she's like an expert at that, right? And I noticed that about her in We Are Lady parts. Um, so I'm, I was glad to see her in that role and I, I like the, I like the, uh, I like the episode overall. Yeah, definitely need to see more of her. Um, it's, she's just really fantastic. I mean, I'm still kind of struggling with the, um, supernatural and with, um, in Black Mirror for this season. 
Um, I don't think that they necessarily had a scientific explanation for the supernatural. Like, I think that would have been kind of interesting to, to actually have, like, I mean, if they kind of tried to make some more sense of it, um, you know, there were some elements of Black Mirror, you know, like when they did the future vision and her, she had that kind of glossed over the technology for the eyes. Um, but I'm kind of like, I mean, I definitely want to talk with the creators and I mean, well, you know, like about, I mean, mean, if they're in the UK, then they're not subject to like, you know, like some of the strikes that we're having. Um, But I do think it's like, it was an interesting choice to include so much of the supernatural in this. Um, And I'm not quite sure if it, if it really served the kind of purpose that made Black Mirror so intriguing and also scary like with the use of technology like so you know like even with the ideas like some of the themes that we're going to talk about like around consciousness and um and and memory and like you know personhood um that we see in foundation and so it becomes like it was like kind of distancing around the kind of ways that our life is is dramatically altered by technology or how technology can amp up the um the intrusiveness of society whether that's like social media or allow us to be either better than who we are or worse than you know who we are as people so i don't like i think it's like the maybe just like the ways that they use supernatural in this I, I'm kind of like for the horror elements and they're not necessarily horror writers. And and I do think in some ways, like some, some horror films, like, I mean, it's boring to me because it's not really tapping into a, an, a true understanding like of how people experience the supernatural and the unknown and, and how frightening that is for people over the, you know, over centuries where we didn't have lights. <laughs> we could right. turn on, you know, like we're, we're animals, like we weren't always apex predator. I mean, we're still not right. always apex predator. So that's, right. you know, I'm kind of like, did that work? Did it not work? I just hope, I don't know what the next season of Black Mirror does, but I just hope it gets back to its roots. Okay. Um, I, I, I can totally, I totally respect that opinion. I, I, yes, I respect that opinion. I see where you're going with that. And I agree. Um, so, having said that, let's rock out um, foundations. I do want to insert a little bit of a preamble before we get like into the beats. I want to remind people that we are not here to tell people what to enjoy. We're not tell, here to tell people what to watch, what to consume. We're simply here just deconstruct. We're simply here deconstructing it for your benefit, because we want um, people to begin to to consume and look at uh, media critically. Having said that. I want people to understand that Foundations is based upon a series of books by Isaac Asimov, and he is considered by many to be one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time. Um, but it's also important to note that Isaac Asimov had a troubled legacy. Um, you know, he was known uh, during his lifetime as uh, someone who frequently inappropriately touched women. Um, uh, on the scale of, of atrociousness, he's probably not anywhere near the worst but it has to be said that he was a groper that he did sometimes um give unwanted attention to women um he but it also speaks to how people liberals can be just as awful as people that we that we politically disagree with and socially disagree with Mm. um he was he was a major um he was a major opponent of 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 john campbell um, who was notoriously like right wing, and he was the editor of Astounding Magazine for like sixty years, fifty years, um, and he actually wrote a couple of essays on on the conference of full rights in the workplace and wages for women. Yet he still did things that were problematic. So, um, and I'm not trying to apol- I'm not trying to be an apologist for his track record. I'm simply saying that the people that we most often politically and socially agree with sometimes are also can be the most problematic. Um, briefly, I also want to mention that there are some ways, and this is reflected in his writing, 
the original Foundation's books were not books about characters. They were books about ideas, as, as Asimov is known for, right? And so a lot of the, most of the characters, if not all, were white men. I think there's one woman in the entire, like, three, you know, three book series. There's one woman, everybody else is white dudes. There are no people of color. And that was originally my hesitance about watching the show, because I thought that they were going to engage in a great deal of tokenism. But I have to say, I'm a convert, because I feel like they they did a treatment of the work very well. They made the story more character-centric and less idea-centric, even though the ideas are still present. And they didn't like have just a bunch of white dudes talking at us. So, should I get into the beats, or do we, do we want to like... I don't, I don't know if we thank, can get into the beats for that, because... Because Asimov, I mean, you know, growing up, right, like, and reading these books as as a young black girl, like, you kind of... It does have that that effect, like, that we're not in, in the future. And so, in some ways, it's like that... I think Asimov and, and Herbert were trying to figure out some of the same things. Can you predict the future, right? And, like, how do you predict the future in rational ways? And then so, but like Herbert did it one way and then Asimov did it another way. So they were kind of like, I think there is like this, there is that kind of discursiveness to it. So that was, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, like the gropiness, like it definitely, you know, like, I mean, yeah, like, you know, your heroes, you got to definitely interrogate your heroes and, and, and see, understand like there's like these huge, like just inconsistencies, grossness about them. Um, and then also what does that mean as like, you know, for like, um, folks who are marginalized and like how they reproduce, um, a world where, where they themselves are like, kind of like don't really exist. So I think that's, that's something also. So we could kind of like unpack, we have like a whole full like season of foundation, but I'm ready to go into this. We're, we're actually diving into the second season of this so so i want to even before we go into the beats of this episode kind of like i guess like with the recap which may or may not matter just because like how it just goes off it veers from the source material um but then there's some aspects where you're like yay that's how they did it but then you know there was a lot of critiques around um that this foundation was going woke but then there's a lot of questions like how are you going to do a story where there's no real characters, you know, like there's like, I mean, they mentioned some of the characters, but then they're just like talking through the problems. Um, And so like in the first season, like one of the introductions that we have is empire, right? Like, so, but they personify empire as a, as like um, a triumvirate that includes leave haste who did an excellent job. So, you know, like, and it actually worked. You works. can say it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to have a very profound disdain for Lee Pace. So, but I, I've, I've been, like the show, I've been converted to, I've been converted. Was so good. Yes, he's been great in so many, in so, so many films. But, I mean, he was, he's really, really intriguing. I mean, you, you have some very intriguing characters and and i think they did some other really good sci-fi things with this so so basically what you have is a show that's inspired by this kind of source material and this idea of like this universe and they try to deal with this problem of like thousands of years by having empire reproduce and i found like that was like within season one actually was very intriguing storytelling was yes. you know so you you have like the scientists like so you have like this um what is it uh histero like it's like he's like a social uh, a sociologist but it's like it's called like uh they have psychohistory psychohistory you're talking about harry selden yeah harry selden who who established this because he sees that this empire is gonna collapse right and so he's trying to find a way to reduce suffering and if he does these particular things like by creating a society where all the smartest people all go there um that'll be okay but he has this other parts of that that are supposed to make sense and i'm probably losing the storylines because i don't do beats as well as you do but you know it's the whole idea that there's this foundation where the best and the brightest we're going 
we're going John we're gonna be on the foundation because I consider myself pretty smart but on that level like maybe I'd be like sweeping the floor I'd be like right. the floors yeah, compared no. to like I would be like hunting people. rabbits right <laughs> <laughs> we'd be like trying yeah, to get I mean, on that shit doing like menial tasks you know because they're like they're real smart people we need somebody to mop shit. up so you can come yeah I, I, no I yeah, the, this idea, and I think, and I really encourage people to look up this idea of psychohistory because it is a concept. And yes, you're right, Harry Seldon is a social scientist, but he's also recognized that there's this convergence, which I've long held, by the way, this convergence between between the humanities and science. Like, they're not, they're not completely separate I- ideas. And the way that they're blended in the show is actually quite nice. So this, there's this idea that all of these psychological, social elements, along with, ma- with predict- predictive mathematics, get blended into a discipline that has a predictive ability to see the future, to see likely futures. And what he does is he recruits all of these people that are, their job is to preserve all of the collective knowledge of human civilization, which is literally hundreds of worlds at this point. Um, and it spans thousands of years. So I'm just, I want to, I'm going to let you continue. I just wanted to shoot that part about psychohistory in there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a beautiful series. Like, you see the vastness of this universe and civilization, but you could also see the fractures that are happening in in the civilization. So, so what I did appreciate about the visuals of this is just, like, how big and grand it is, even though it's, like, focused on a few characters, which, um, you know, like, watching some of the sci-fi shows, like, where I always felt like they made the world or the universe very small, um, this one, it kind of gives you that sense of expansiveness. Um, and, and then you also like with the, with the character of empire, which you have brother Dawn, brother day and brother dusk. Is that right? Like, I'm just like, yeah. so it's like, yeah. um, where there's like the young one who's decanted. Then there's like the one who is, who is mature. Like, I mean, I'm, a, I mean, it's sort of. I have a hard time, like, I mean, what age is Brother Day supposed to be? Like, I'm like, he's like, maybe in his 40s, but, you know, I mean. Probably like 30 to 50, you know, when he reaches like. like 30. Well, he's not 30 most of the time that we see him, but I think that's when he probably assumes the throne. So we have these three, we have these three clones of this one emperor, Cleon the first, Mm -hmm. and each of those clones represents obviously different points in their and their maturation, right? So you have the young one, like you said, and his job is basically to be guided and mentored to become eventually day. And the old guy who is kind of put out to pasture, right? He paints the murals. And, and so what it does is it creates this illusion of per, of not just perpetuity, but what's the word I'm looking for, but um, continuity, right? Mm-hmm. So they're always being ruled by these three clones of one person, which is, as I mentioned to you previously, is... Um, it's like the the oh, it, anyway continue i'll get back to that yeah like and so they're, so they're supposed to be the same and so he has like the same inclination right i mean we're assuming that which which i'm kind of like nurture versus nature but it's like but there's always changing circumstances so how how do they get it where you know eventually like when the ruler is like you know brother day is ruling he's like almost the same person like kind of makes similar choices and um i'm still kind of struck like it's like that there's the existential problem but i mean i'm i'm trying to think about the logistics of that because you know i mean people can have vastly different personalities because like just the randomness like there's chaos theory so i just felt like they didn't they're not taking that into account but they're the way that they introduce it is that through an act of like eco like of terrorism that they introduce variety in the genes so he's never the same person so then now he's veering off from his path which was like maybe a foil to harry selden's uh or sheldon's i'm really bad with names and Selden, days. Right, yeah. i'm a historian i'm gonna be i'm gonna be a like a, a psycho historian you know i can think about the future it's like okay but yes. um yeah you know I mean, I'm it's like it. i can dig it so the um, so what we saw was like there was one he was left-handed, um, you know he had little like he had flaws and so that one was killed, but it's introduced in the whole system where now they're changing and so 
Um, in season two, we now have a, um, you know, like we, we have uh, Cleon who is like, I'm going to have a baby, you know, like, so he wants right. to make some babies. And, um, you know, like, so I wasn't really expecting that, you know, like now he's supposed to get a bride. Um, you know, well, I thought the idea, know. the, uh -huh. go ahead. Oh, no, it, I thought the original the now the episode. Yeah. I thought I thought the original idea. So, so I I, I want to give a general overview of of the of the concept, which is the whole idea of, of of foundation is about a galactic empire, a galactic human empire, which is not centered on Earth. It's not even mentioned. Okay, uh, the planet is called Trantor, um, and there are core planets, and then there are outer rim planets. And basically, there's a guy named Harry Seldon who's like he he basically has this mathematical formula that basically says hey this empire is going to collapse and when it does collapse there's going to be like I think he said like a thousand or ten thousand years of darkness of just war and famine and pestilence and disease or whatever and the emperor is like originally is going to kill him and is like no I'm going to exile you now before this happens he he basically puts out this like prize where you know mathematicians from all over the galaxy can like basically try to solve this one equation and this one young woman named Gale solves it except she comes from a planet of basically of luddites right they like hate technology so she turns her back basically she's ex essentially exiled from her people to go and help you know to go and help Harry Seldon they all get exiled and this exile is called the, the, this group that they exile is called the foundation hence the name of the book the foundation's job is to mitigate the harm of the collapsing empire. So by preserving all human knowledge, they can reduce this period of darkness to like 10% of what it originally was, if not completely avoid it. Um, but there are all kinds of sidetracks, which I, which I can't get into because they're, they're too numerous, right? Which is kind of the point. <laughs> um, so now at season two, um, Harry Seldon, who dies in the first season, he's, his consciousness has been duplicated twice and is imprisoned in this thing called the Prime, Prime Radiant, which is the physical manifestation of the psychohistoric record, right, or, or prediction, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is in this vault on the planet called Terminus, where the Foundation exists. Terminus was originally this kind of backwater colony, and sent from between Season 1 and Season 2, 140 years have passed, and they have flourished. And they have begun to make, uh, um, you know, alliances with other outer rim planets, which now, originally, the the empire was not sure, did not know about. They now are aware of. So, but part of it is, there are a couple of things that that should be mentioned, um, because that's as far into the beats as I can really get without just explaining every detail. That's how voluminous it is. Is that this idea of the, the emperor and the empire are very sort of Roman throwbacks, right? They're very Roman, Greco-Roman. They they're very influenced by that. And part of it is this idea of continuation of dynasty through incest. And to me, the idea of cloning oneself over and over again, because I think the Cleonic dynasty at this point has been around for like six or 700 years, 800 years. The idea of cloning oneself over and over again just for the purposes of rule is the ultimate incest. You're literally just breeding. Uh, you're using a monoculture to breed yourself over and over again, which is insanity to me. Like, um, but but I, but the, but the, also the the three, as you pointed out, the three, you know, dusk, day, dawn. They're all like a triumvirate. Even though day is the ultimate say, they all have some influence over policy. So, season two is. It's really hard to really get into it. Gail is a, is a young black woman played by Lulo Bell. She is a pleasure to watch. She's a fantastic actress. Um, I want to say Lee Harvey plays Salvar Hardin. That's her name, Lee Harvey. And she is basically, through a, through a series of weird temporal events, she is Gail's daughter, right? She's her, you know, born by a surrogate. So what you have now is the Empire now thinking about marry, marrying a woman who's the queen of another planet in order to shore up their waning power. And what I want to ask you about, Marguerite, in that regards, getting into the questions now, is how it's such, even though that, that system of government is very different from what we experience today, many of the dynamics appear to be very similar. In, in particular, 
the increase of violence as empires begin to wane. Like, there seems to be a, a, a correlation between the two. But also, I, w I would like to relate this to Demon 79 in that one of the things that Day says is foreigners look more foreign every year, even those we embrace. And one of the first things that Day says in the very first episode of the first season is, enjoy my peace, right? Coming, you know, coming into when she, when when uh, Gail is coming into immigration, she's like, enjoy my peace. And how long will you be here? And, you know, what I mean, they were very intrusive about questioning her. So I, w I know that's a lot to snap off. So so please answer as you can. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you had this like technological planet, which was like really amazing, like when you're like looking at it and like how they kind of show show that planet and even like the the ways like it connected you know, up to the, I don't know, like into space. And when that fell was like so dramatic of creating this huge rift. Um, and that was like this act of terrorism that that um, did occur that allowed like, you know, like it was, you know, so like season one, like had a lot of like interesting things and interesting ways like with the sets. But, um, you know, I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you, you have, um, you know, like the Egyptians, which, I mean, I don't know, like, why Black folks are, like, so obsessed around, you know, ancient Egypt. Like, we just need to let that go. Like, I'm like, why are we, like, obsessed with, like, incestuous, like, Ptolemies and, you know, things like that. Like, it's just, like, it's kind of gross. Like, I mean, yeah, like, they, they, it was very oppressive to create those kind of the buildings itself, which can stand, like, they, they're still still there, like, the, the ancient Egyptian ruins. Um, but like with the Roman Empire, right? Like as it as it grew, like I mean, the violence was on the borders, but they did things to really keep the center together, right? It's like bread and circus type of things, but also like if you kind of have a frontier where you throw your young men to to die, um, you know, like that's always like a very, um, you know, that's like what empires do. That's what America does. Like we have a constant frontier, and we we. Um, consider like our young men and women expendable in that um so i mean the the wealthy um but a lot of people in different societies like they have ways where they use like either proximity through family um so like in like the like i think it's like in the kabil region like paula not paula Freire, but pierre burdu had actually like he has like things like gift giving but even like the marriage cycles within like and some of like the arab societies it's like they keep wealth within the family as long as like the ideal marriage is between like your your paternal uncle's son and so like so like even like if you marry the girl out like even if she inherits wealth it stays within the family like a paternalistic family line so what we are seeing is that like um patriarchy um or mat uh, pat patrilineal type of system. Matrilineal systems do exist in African societies and in some Asian societies, but it's not about like, oh yeah, women are ruling and they're all powerful, but it's that the power and inheritance is passed on through the, the women's family's line. So it's like the maternal uncle inherits. And so the sons learn from the uncle, like the father may be in and out, you know, so but if you look at like some things in, in like history or you look at like what happens in famines and things, um, you know, there's like a whole other thing like as far as like, like how patrilineal societies exist. But what I do think is that um, it's not the matter of like that the empire is more violent, like that you have peace and there's n lack of violence because there's different forms of violence of the state in this sure. empire, right? Different forms of control that they're utilizing to maintain order and maintain that equilibrium. And it's incredibly violent, but it's very polite violent. And then it's, and you can see that on the outer worlds or who gets exiled um, and the victims of that, which they did, you know, in some ways like highlight that this was like, like the, I guess like the one society, there was like one society that was punished, um, like when there was a terror attack, that was like, I think it was like, it was made, like it was internal, but then that planet was like punished and you had the survivors and then they came back to enact revenge.
So um, I think it was that... two. It was actually two. Was it the Thespians and the the Arachnians? Oh yeah, that's true. So there were two planets and... that were that were they where they destroyed half the population of both planets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Through that, like right. you know, those strikes. It was it was pretty. Br I mean, it was like it was. A I, terrible... I think that's what I was kind of alluding yeah. to was this mm -hmm. idea that 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 empires tend to opt for more overt types of physical violence it, it went because they they become more like cornered beasts you know what i mean like you know harry selden said that the empire was going to collapse but the empire clearly was already waning right by the time mm -hmm. harry selden was probably even born and so when i see when i look back at at, at things like you know even the roman empire you know they were you know, they were incredibly, I mean, not that they weren't violent all the time, but they went through this period of pacification, and then there are these periods of, of you know, punitive citizenry and then regression, and then as they were leaving, they were, like, burning down entire cities. So I was like, I feel like, so, may, so maybe that's not a, an appropriate corollary, but I feel, I, that, but that's sort of, like, the impression that I got in watching it, so... So thanks yeah, for I mean, and you're, that. Yeah, and, but I mean, if, and we can look at, like, maybe, like, the longest empire which is like the the Ottoman Empire, right? And so it's like, so like, what did that look like when the Ottoman Empire is waning? And I think that a lot of times, like, you know, in sci-fi, like they're kind of, like both they're looking at, like, I mean, the Ottoman history, which was well known, right? And this idea that it's like, it became isolated. It became something that was corrupted from its kind of greatness. And its greatness was because it just had that constant frontier where they were like expanding beyond and then what happens when empires stop expanding and that's been part of our like I, I think like in a lot of ways has framed our understanding even of, of like unfettered capitalism that it always has to keep growing I think the other part that I I mean I'm still trying to you know like one it's like you're we're understanding right it's like the the we're trying to like that as this the empires collapse that the most vulnerable people like there's a lot of people that are vulnerable to that collapse and yeah. that's what they're trying to 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 deal with but i i guess it's like i'm just wondering like why wasn't the choice to have like little anarchic places you know like it's just kind of like why was it the choice like that it was like empire consolidation and or it's like chaos in the planets being a little bit more isolated, you know, maybe being more sustainable, like as opposed to having that kind of growth. So those it's are like massive the kind of waste questions. Is, even even by by day's admission in this episode, the massive waste of inspiring awe in in a population you mean to rule, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I also want to because we we are running out of time, and and I I want to talk about this idea of a, of AI personhood, but we may have to wait until mm -hmm. next week for that one because that's a really deep concept. But it's, I want to put it on the table. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to, I really wanted to, well, first of all, I want to come back to Lee Pace real quick. Because my man was ripped to shreds, right? He was yeah. cut. Like, that was one good-looking, ripped man. I mean, dietarily, because you, you asked this question, what is his diet? And I'm going to say his <laughs> diet was, was, wa was water and salad with no dressing. No dressing, but, yeah. But, so I'm going to lay that out there, but I'm going to, so I'm actually going to ask you about AI personhood. I want you to tell me, because we've only got a few minutes left, I want you to tell me <laughs> in a minute or less, I want you to tell me what you think about the idea of, of robotic slash AI personhood. I'll, I'll, I want your take and then I'll give my take. It is, um... I mean, personhood, you know, I mean, once once something becomes aware um, and wants to live, right, you know, so it's like it is, that's, um, it's a scary thought. I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's happening, right? Um, where is the autonomy, you know, like in that, like what happens when somebody's like not only their personhood, especially if we're thinking about the difference between like cloning, so like you have manufactured human beings right Interesting from point. flesh as opposed to now this consciousness thinks like a human being has desires like a human being and so like 
what are like a AI rights, you know? So, so I'm like, I guess like I'm on the fence of it. I, I think we definitely crossed a line and, and a dangerous threshold as far as what we're doing, what we've done with technology. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I think that there's something that is completely unique for, uh, for human beings, like in, the, in our own, um, like how he, like life on earth exists. So it's not quite the same. It's something that's imitating life. Um, and, and it can't, I mean, maybe it can't, can, I mean, it's like, until we get to the point where it could be like self replicating, like in itself, then, then I think we, we don't have to, to necessarily afford it the same type of human rights, you know, like, I mean, we, we, I mean, we eat cows and chickens and, you know, so when is a certain point when, when we have like, you know, like, and I, so, I mean, I, I understand like PETA's argument is like, you know, around speciesism, but I do think it's, um, we're, we're going down a very dangerous road when it comes to artificial intelligence and, and consciousness and the idea that there are people that want to upload their consciousness. Like they want to live forever through machinery, which is like, I'm like, you're not the same person. You could never be the same person because the mind, like just the biology of the brain and everything is just so, so, so the, nuanced and chaotic. And So they, they touch upon that briefly because Dusk says to Dawn when they're waiting for the queen to arrive, he's asking him about him having sex with Denzermel, the, the robot. And I, and I think it's important to under, for people to understand something about her. Um, because a lot, even though, even though Asimov's writings do not occupy a, a, a common universe, they all draw on similar concepts. So the laws of robotics come from Isaac Asimov, right? And so Denzermel is basically the last surviving android. And I hate the fact that they keep calling her a robot because she's not a robot. She's an android, right? She's more like Data than she is like the Terminator, right? <laughs> so the point that I'm making is that she's the last surviving. And she's like 10,000 years old. She's really old, right? So she's the last surviving robot in a conflict in which human beings basically had their own kind of butlerian jihad, right? They rebelled mm-hmm. against the robots because the robots were trying to control everything. Robots had the three laws, but they learned how to circumvent them and it became a war. So she's the basically the last one. Now, the thing that Dusk gets into Day's face about is is that even though she's a robot and she's here to serve you, she can't consent to sex, right? And so you had sex with her and that's weird, right? She changed your diaper. I don't know that the change your diaper is really a good argument for that, but the fact that, like, she can't consent. That's where I thought. That's where I thought he was going with it. So, I also kind of want to make the distinction between AI and androids, right? Androids mm-hmm. do. They are anthropomorphized AIs essentially, but they're not necessarily AIs in and of themselves. Um, now, having said that, I want to address your point about AI. I agree. I think that we're not at a point where we need to sort of confer rights. We're at a point when it, with the technology where we need to begin to restrict it and to control its proliferation, which we're not doing. And it is disenfranchising. As you can see, we're in the middle of strikes right now. Um, mm-hmm. And so we need to not only restrict it and control it because it's disenfranchising the poorest people in the country and making the wealthiest people richer. We need to restrict it and control it because that enmity is going to generationally carry on. And when we do eventually achieve a singularity with AI, and by singularity I mean they are self-aware, that may or may not be possible, or robotics, then there will be less likely a chance that human beings will harbor or inherit bigoted or biased ideas about what they are. And by extension, we can avoid a Matrix-style, right, like robot takeover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really do. I think that the Matrix style takeover would still have human beings behind it that would still benefit from that. You Ooh, know, it would nice. be really an excuse. Like, so that in that way, it was like that AI, that, you know, machinery is like you really use to control other people and and predict and, and to eliminate. So it would be like very genocidal and, and selective and, and like making people unfree. Um, that's a very, I, 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 I want to, mm-hmm. that's a really, really, really good point. And I, I want to, I'm not going to, so what you're saying is 
that our fear, our, our fears are misplaced because it's not really the machines that we need to be worried about so much as the, the capitalist masters who are creating them. Yeah, yeah, we got to be, Bingo. and who will, and also like who will benefit. They'll be like, oh yeah, we're going to let it run, run havoc because we want to, we want to, you know, um, what is it like thin the herd? Sell you this <laughs> anti robot gun, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like and make money and, and that they're you know, who could be protected by from the technology are the wealthy, but the poor people who live in apartments or live in, in, in urban spaces who can't, you know, go to Air Force One, like they'll be okay. Uh I mean they'll be the ones that'll be harmed by the technology and the global warming, like that it's always going to affect um, the global south and the poor and so um, but in the meantime we're not going to necessarily look at who's going to benefit when um, you know like this stuff goes awry so that's that's my big concern if it was like all kind of equal and all place but it's like no we're, we may have movies that will show like oh yeah like in the cities in the sky will fall out it's like no like there will be these types of hierarchies. And so really, if we start to have more people like the regular everyday people become more aware of the choices that are being made that are affecting us, then then I mean, I do think we should be involved in understanding those regulations because it's yes, like, agreed. you know, how could you be a, um, you know, libertarian and you're just like looking at you know what's happening and you're like yeah corporations are people and have more rights than people right and you know, i can get well they're just right yeah right-wing enablers <laughs> okay yeah. well we are we are we are we are coming up on time um and i appreciate all of your thoughts on this they've been very poignant and very insightful um and obviously we've got a lot to discuss um this season we can revisit the issue of ai we can talk about densermel we can talk about um, even some of the sort of missionaria protectiva junk that went on last season. We need to sort of touch on that a little bit. But, you know, and obviously we're only going to get one episode a week. So next week we're going to talk about uh, episode two, and I'm really looking forward to it. So I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in to Fresh Pulp Magazine's uh, Dark Matter Space. Uh, sorry, Dark Matter Podcast. I, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't. The trauma. <laughs> Our roots. The trauma I want to thank everybody for tuning into Dark Matter going. Podcast. Uh, I want to, I want to thank Marguerite <laughs> Hill, who is my my co-host, for being here. Please go and check out Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative. Please go and check out uh, Fresh Pulp Magazine's uh, social media, and please join us next week. Like, share, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Please like, share, and subscribe. We're trying to monetize. Until then, everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we will see you next week. Thank you, Marguerite. Thank you.